Good afternoon, everybody. This is the Greek Scientist Society in one of our weekly webinars. This afternoon, uh, Professor Ludovic Veille from the University of Cambridge is here with us with a very interesting discussion. Uh, before uh, inviting him to the stand, I would like to thank uh, everyone watching us today from uh, our live streaming in Facebook and uh, YouTube. And I would like to uh, invite the attendees of uh, the AirMeet platform to familiarize a bit with uh, our platform features so that we can have at the end of uh, Professor Vallès discussion a more interactive uh, discussion. Uh, on your left top, there is a right hand feature, and if you wish to get, uh, and if you wish to, to come on, uh, on board, uh, you can just uh, click on the raised hand, you can introduce yourself at the beginning, and uh, uh, come forward with your question. At the bottom of your screen, um, uh, there, is a, there is a share, a share screen for you to activate your cameras. And uh, we will be starting now our first session for tonight uh, in the next one minute. Uh, so please join session and join us. We are very much looking forward to hosting you all uh, today. I will give you a very short introduction of uh, uh, Professor Ludovic Valle uh, Bio. He's a professor of regenerative medicine to the Department of Surgery in Cambridge University, a senior group leader at the Cambridge Stem Cell, uh, Stem Cell Institute and director of the Cambridge Biomedical Research School facility. His overall work revolves around investigating molecular mechanisms of differentiation, but also wants to generate cell types for clinical studies and for cell-based uh, therapy. Uh, his group is working extensively on human embryonic stem cells and human-induced pluripotent stem cells by discovering key mechanism controlling the differentiation and pluripotency. So it will be very interesting to have him on stage uh, to hear his presentation on stem cell technologies to study the liver in health and disease. Professor, thank you very much for being here tonight. The stand is yours. Thank you very much for the, the introduction and for the invitation to be here today. So I've, I've the plan took uh, around 45, 50 minutes. It's okay. It's the right hands. Uh, just course. let me know if if, uh, if it's uh, no, too too long, or and I, I will uh, no basically uh, stop and, and ask and answer a question. Okay. So today I'm, I'm really going to present um, my work, uh, the work of my lab on no, uh, the use of stem cells to study liver and to try to find new therapy for liver disease. So I'm going to of course start to introduce the liver. Uh, so the liver is amazing organ is the biggest solid organ in, in the body and uh, it fulfills a broad number of functions. So it's a bi uh, in charge of detoxification. So each time, that you, each time you take a medication, a drug, the liver makes sure it doesn't kill you. Uh, it's in charge of detoxification of alcohol, of course, but there's also a key uh, organ storage is uh, uh, store iron, vitamins, um, key metabolic organ, uh, you know, metabolize glycogen, glucose, and also a lot of lipids. And it's also a key secretory organ because it produces a lot of protein that are key for uh, human life, including uh, clotting factors, but also albumin, which is the most uh, abundant protein in, in the serum. And so most of those functions, in fact, are fulfilled by one cell type, one cell type in the liver, which are the hepatocytes. The hepatocytes you know, represent 90% of the liver, and they basically fulfill all those key functions I, I just mentioned. So really, you no, know, it's a really exciting cell type because it fulfills so many questions so so many of those functions the other key cell type in the liver proper is cholangiocyte uh those cholangiocytes in fact line up the biliary tree which is a network of conduits which are located in the liver uh and which basically drain the liver from all the toxin and waste that are produced by the hepatocyte and especially by acid so those cholangiocytes are also very important uh but uh, today I really will focus only on hepatocytes. Cholangiocytes will be you know, introduced, discussed much more in detail by Fotis Sampaziotis, who is a, a, a clinician working in my lab and that you know, will have soon his own, own independent lab. And I think he's been invited for one of the ne next sessions. So the hepatocytes are key, okay? And the problem with hepatocytes is that, uh, no, they um, have a key issue. So 
what is interesting with the liver, and I put this uh, this picture because, of course, now I, I know that uh, it's going to resonate with the audience, is that the liver now is an incredibly regenerative organ. And the ancient Greek already knew that, and that's why they created the uh, Prometheus legend. I, and I'm not going to discuss this legend because you know it better than I do. But in fact, no, the liver, have this, uh, this legend is based on the fact that the liver can regenerate itself. You can cut half of your liver, in theory, and it will regrow. Okay, so it's an amazing regenerative organ. But the truth is that, no, it's true for a very specific case, and it doesn't work very well in uh, chronic disease. And that's why, by uh, the liver disease, in fact, are one of the most, um, no, one of the rare modern diseases where mortality is still increasing year on year. And that's the fact that, by uh, there is a lack of treatment and therapy against liver disease. So during a long time, no, people thought that the liver was able to regenerate, to cure itself. But the truth is that when you have chronic disease, or even very severe acute liver disease, the liver is not able to repair itself and biically enter in, in what we call end-stage liver disease, which biically is, is you know, life-threatening and, and really problematic. And really now, this uh, uh, biically uh, all problem with liver disease is becoming a, a worldwide global challenge, uh, which is no, really uh, becoming uh, one of the key for ample admission in the NHS in the UK uh, liver, uh, are liver disease. So really it's becoming very, very important problem on, on the global stage. Um, so one of the key uh, no, driver of this increase in mortality, this increase of people with liver disease in a uh, no, hospital worldwide is a disease called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And I will come back on the, this uh, on this disease, but basically it's induced by the accumulation of fat in the liver. And it's it's it is known that you know, in the UK, 20 to 40 percent of the population will have what we call a, a fatty liver. So hopefully, no, it's not dangerous to have fatty liver. But the problem is that in a certain number of cases, this uh, fatty liver will evolve into a progressive disease that will result again into liver failure. And now, no, NAFLD, which is a relatively recent disease because it's associated with obesity and diabetes, is becoming the main source of uh, admission for liver disease in, in the UK. And it's bike exploding in all the modern countries, but also in, in developing countries where no, there's change in dietary uh, habits. And that's really, really a really big disease, which we don't really understand very well. And so all that, of course, no, is even... So there is no cure for those diseases. And the only treatment currently available for the end-stage liver disease, where basically your liver fail and can't function anymore, is liver transplantation. So basically, when you have a progressive liver disease, there's currently no cure, and you're going to, to either end up with a transplantation or with liver cancer. And that's, of course, a big problem because there is a massive shortage of organ and uh, no there's a really limited number of patients that can benefit from liver transplantation. And of, even those patients that benefit from this therapy you know, undergo a very immuno, heavy treatment with immunosuppressive drugs uh, that really uh, decrease their quality of life. And most of the time, in fact, you know, also end up with you know, their liver being rejected and again you know, uh, end up with, with uh, uh, unstaged liver disease. So that's... You know, that's the issue and in fact one of the possibilities you know and is to basically be able to uh, grow hepatocytes in vitro and to use them as a source for cell based therapy and instead of replacing the anti organ it would be to basically use those hepatocytes uh, directly transplant them in the patient liver for them to replace you know, the damaged uh, uh, cells so that's a, a first approach. The problem is that hepatocytes cannot be grown in vitro. So as I told you, know, this, uh, li the liver is this incredibly regenerative organ, but the truth is that as soon as we take hepatocytes out of the liver, they start to de-differentiate and they lose their uh, metabolic activity. And they can't be, uh, they don't proliferate at all. So likely at the moment, we know we are faced with the, the fact that you know, we can't grow those cells. So, so uh, it's really problematic for regenerative medicine application, but also really problematic for development of drug because we don't have a good in vitro model for, uh, for, to study those diseases, to study the liver in vitro. And that's why my group and a lot of other groups have decided to try to find a solution to this challenge to generate hepatocytes in vitro. 
And for that, what we want to use is uh, human prepotent stem cells and organoid. So what are human prepotent stem cells? So human prepotent stem cells can be derived from uh, two sources. The first one is uh, what we call human embryonic stem cells, which are derived from embryo uh, generated from in vitro uh, fecundation. And those human embryonic stem cells are, are derived from the inner cell mass of uh, human embryo at the blastocyst stage. And when we used to derive human ear cells, no, uh, we, we don't do that anymore, but no, 10 or 15 years ago, uh, what we used to do is to basically isolate this inner cell mass, put that in culture. And sometimes it was a very inefficient process. We uh, were used to get lines that we call human embryonic stem cells. And over the years, now we have refined this process and we can grow now those cells in fully chemically defined conditions without any you know, uh, unknown factors that could impair uh, their use for clinical application. The second uh, proponent cells that we are using more and more in the lab and is slowly but surely replacing human ammonic stem cells are human induced proponent stem cells or IPS cells. So these cells are generated by direct reprogramming of somatic cells by overexpression of the what we call Yamanaka factors, OC4, SOX2, KL4, and SEMIC. And when you overexpress those four factors in those somatic cells, skin cells, blood cells, they basically reprogram into cells that look very similar to human ammonic stem cells. So basically, human ear cells and human IPS have the same properties. They don't have the same origin, but they really share the, the, the same characteristic. And in the lab, we really can't distinguish human ear cells from human IPS. And that's why, you know, during my talk, I'm not really distinguish those two cell types. And the last system that we're also starting to, uh, to use more and more are organoid, which are basically... Um, uh, primary cells, so basically cells that come from tissue, from organs, that you can put in culture using 3D culture condition and modulating wind signaling. So this culture system has been developed by Hans Clever uh, with intestinal gut organoid, uh, and then transferred to a lot of different organs, and we are using this system to grow organoid from, uh, from the liver. And you will see how we do that. Okay, so how do we... Uh, so that's just to present you on human embryonic stem cells. Uh, so that's a colony that contains around you know, 2,000 cells. So those cells, the big elements that they have, that they can self-renew. So we can grow them for almost you no know, 100 passages uh, in, a cult in a petri dish, and they maintain their unique property of differentiation. They can directly differentiate into almost the cell type of the adult body. And in the lab, now we've done blood differentiation, cardiac, neurons, beta cells, Pocardic beta cells, gut, lung, and of course, liver. And that's now really the combination of those two properties, infinite proliferation and capacity of differentiation, that make those cells uniquely interesting for clinical application because we can imagine to produce large quantity of cells you know, with a clinical interest for ever cell-based therapy or disease modeling using this approach. Of course, no, I, I, IPS are, are also quite interesting because we can directly now derive IPS. It's a very efficient process from any patient or any individual. So patient with disease, patient with genetic disorder, uh, and directly we can get those cells by simply you know, taking a bit of a skin from those patients and reprogram them in, in, into a IPS that we can then differentiate into any cell type we want. Um, and that just, no. Uh, give you an overview of what it's look like in a, in, in the dish. So that's a colony, uh, no, with few thousand cells. And that basically be, be, will be the size of the colony that we have on the tip of a pen. So just to give you on the scale of what we are working on, because of course, no, um, that's always good to have a, a clear vision. So how do we drive the differentiation of this human prepotent stem cells into a hepatocyte, into liver cells? So over the years, no, that's been a key expertise in my lab. So basically, we have used uh, the knowledge generated by development of biology to generate culture conditions that allow us to mimic in vitro the normal uh, fetal development, normal organ organogenesis. And we're basically applying this recipe. And really, our expertise is to transfer this basic knowledge into something that is you know, applicable in vitro. So basically, what we do, we take human embryonic stem cells and we differentiate them into endoderm, which is the earlier progenitor of all the endodermal organ, including the liver, but also the lung, the pancreas, and so on. And then we specify those endoderm into forgot, which is another progenitor of liver. And then we drive this differentiation of those forgot into a hepatoblast, which is the earliest progenitor of the, of the liver. And we differentiate those hepatoblasts into hepatocytes. And then we have a, a long phase of maturation where we're going to try to, for those hepatocytes to acquire more and more metabolic function. 
And that's you now give you uh, the result at the end. So the protocol is around 35 days. Uh, and by, you know, uh, all the cells, 95%, 99% of the cells will express albumin, a key marker of the liver, alpha-1 and trypsin, version 4 which is transcription factors, a key master regulator in the liver. They will have also key functional activity of the liver, so they will uh, be able to metabolize urea, they will secrete albumin, they will secrete al uh, alpha-1 and trypsin, the protein produced by the liver, and also, which is really important, they will display what, a CYP3A4 activity, which is basically a protein involved in detox drug detoxification, and CYP3A4 is, is very famous in the ph pharma world, because this enzyme will detoxify 50% of the drug that the people take, and when you have basically a drug that is not detoxified by CYP3A4, you always end up with a, a, a big problem with your liver. So that's give you know, a, a way we do things and what are the ca characterization we perform on the cells. And uh, what I think an important point I need to underline is that, so as I told you, we're trying to model normal development in a dish, but we do that in 35 days. And the liver is an organ that is extremely uh, no, long to mature in, 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 in human. In fact, the, the liver no, starts to be fully functional in human nine to 12 months after birth. And in fact, the functional maturation of the liver really starts after birth. That's why, you know, you have young baby that get jaundice is when their liver has some difficulty to kick in. And that's no, that show you one of the key challenges we are facing to, to produce cells in vitro from human problem stem cells is to basically produce in a few weeks what normal development will take almost two years. And I will come back to that uh, again during my talk. So uh, what those cells are, are really you no know, liver cells. We can use them for a number of applications. So for example, we already showed that those cells can be transplanted in vivo in a mouse liver. So for that, we use uh, animal model for acute liver. So it's mice that basically express a toxic transgene in the hepatocyte. So the hepatocyte die. And then we come with our cells generated in vitro. We transplant that in the mice. And what we observe is this nice, nice nodule of human hepatocyte in the mouse liver. And they express human albumin or human alpha one and trypsin. And we can detect those protein in the serum of the mice, showing that the cells have been transplanted and are functional. So that's mean that really those cells in vitro now can basically could, could be used for cell based therapy. And that's something that we are exploring very actively. Uh, the other thing is that we can do this modeling with those cells. And you know, I'm just showing you an example of a genetic disorder here. So what we did is that we derived the human induced purple stem cells from patients with alpha-1 alpha one antitrypsin, which is a disease that affects uh, production of alpha-1, and that basically killed the liver. So all the patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin end up with a liver transplant. But nobody knows why this mutation is inducing cell death in the liver. And so what we decided to do is to uh, try to understand how this mutation can affect hepatocytes function and survival. So we derived the hepatocyte, no, we generated IPS from those patients. We then use CRISPR-Cas9 to correct the mutation that induced the disease to generate IPS cells that will be corrected and so wild type. And then we generated the hepatocyte from the mutant cells and the corrected cells. And because we can grow a bucket of those cells, we were able to perform very large scale analysis, no, what we call omics, I mean proteomics lopids and uh, ARNA-seq. And then by actually using this, uh, uh, this comparison, we are able to identify new biomarkers for the disease, which allows us now to understand a bit better why the, the mutation on alpha-1 induced cell death in hepatocyte. So what I'm trying to say is simply by, you know, that with the cells now, we can also uh, understand better biology of disease and generate new knowledge, So, which is really important because, in fact, there is some diseases, especially like alpha-1, that cannot be modeled uh, with other systems. For example, in mouse, no alpha-1 and trypsin will not result in liver failure. So that's now really important that now we have a human system that are to model those human diseases. So uh, now let's come back to more complex disorder. Let's come back to uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So I told you, you no know, key challenge, uh, key healthcare challenge um, globally, uh, really a uh, large population, uh, large part of the population is affected. Um, it's a progressive disease, so only a small fraction of those 30-40% that have a fatty liver will progress to uh, no, uh, end stage, but when they start to progress, it's unstoppable. We don't know why they progress, we don't know how, how long it's going to take to progress, but when they start, there's nothing we can do to stop those patients to basically um, progress to our cirrhotic stage, 
ou un hépa, euh, hépatocellular carcinoma, liver cancer. And patient with you know, a progressive NAFLD, NASH, will end up with a liver transplantation, will end up with uh, you know, a, more, a much bigger problem. And at the moment, no, so this disease, we know, uh, no, we know the markers, we know to diagnose, to perform a diagnostic on the disease. But as I say, no, we don't know the mechanism that induces the progression. We don't know what the mechanism that, uh, no, will allow us to predict how this disease is going to be, to, to evolve. And there is no very efficient and good animal model to do that, but there is a lack of human information, especially because we know that part of the disease is associated with the genetic, with human genetics. And that's why you now we decided to, to check if we could use human purple stem cells to model this disease, to model basically the fat accumulation in hepatocyte, but also the cell death that is induced by the fat accumulation, which are the two main aspects, you no know, two key stages of the disease. And to do that, what we did, so, uh, is basically, um, uh, decided to, to use our system, uh, where we produce hepatocyte in vitro from human purple stem cells, but to, uh, basically use a, a, a bit more complex system where we do a 3D culture, uh, with different cell types that are in the liver. And the goal for that was basically to be able to uh, model the different aspect of the, the disease. Because as I told you, you now, it's a progressive disease, which induced first the accumulation of fat in hepatocyte. But then this accumulation of fat now induce uh, inflammation, fibrosis, so secretion of extracellular matrix, and ultimately cell death of hepatocyte. So what we decided to do is really try to really model those different stages. And for that, we needed to introduce additional cells, stellar cells, which are known to be involved in fibrosis, macrophages, which are known to be uh, involved in inflammation, and cholangiocytes, you know, which are involved in the response to disease through ductular reaction. And um, so, we uh, basically uh, develop the system where we uh, take all, we derive hepatocyte from IPS, and then we derive all those cells also from IPS. So basically, you know, uh, all anterior system generates in vitro from human purple and stem cells. And then we combine all those cell types in a 3D scaffold based on collagen, where we basically can uh, look at uh, cell-cell interaction and, and basically try to see what is the impact of this interaction. So that's the example here. You have basically uh, uh, cells that are hepatocytes that have been generated from human prevalent stem cells grown in fatty acid, which are known to induce NAFLD and NASH in human, oleic acid, for example. And in this case, you can see that you know, we uh, did this treatment in 2D, and in 2D, we don't see a lot of lipid accumulation, or we have very little lipid accumulation. Whereas when we go in 3D in our scaffold, what we observe is that you now after 24 hours, we're going to have a massive accumulation of lipids, uh, shown by those very nice lipid droplets by this body pistoning. And um, so that's now show that basically we can model uh, fat accumulation in the liver using this approach. Then what we did is basically uh, use another fatty acid, palmic acid, which is known to be lipotoxic. So that is more involved in the second phase of the disease when you start to lose hepatocyte. And here again, now we uh, grow our cells in palmic acid. And after a week, basically, we see a very strong decrease in viability on our cells. So in that now again, all hepatocyte grow, generated in vitro grown in tree are sensitive to palmic acid. So we can model lipid accumulation and uh, 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 lipotoxicity. Then what we did is by, you know, start to mix all the different cell types. And I'm just showing you here the example where we have all the cell type, hepatocyte, cholangiocytes, cell cell and macrophages. And what was very interesting is that, you no, know, in, in this case, the cells are uh, expressing RFP and GFP. So the, in green, you have the hepatocyte. In red, you have the cholangiocyte. In blue, you have the LX2. I mean, the stellar cells. And what you can see is that uh, the hepatocytes self-organize around the cholangiocytes, like they will do in vivo. So you have a self-organization that starts to mimic what we can see in the normal architecture of the liver. And you have also LX2 that likely uh, are located in between the hepatocyte and the cholangiocyte. Again, trying to uh, reproduce what you can see in, in the liver. And what is interesting is that those cells in co-culture also have an increase or improve uh, functional maturity. They are you now expressed and secret a high level of albumin. They have a consistent c 3 f activity and they produce bile acid, key function of the liver. So the question is, can we use it to model uh, NAFLD in vitro? And the answer, the short answer is yes. If we directly add oleic acid or palmic acid, what we see when we add oleic acid, we have a strong 
a lipid accumulation, only in hepatocytes, as you will, will expect, and uh, the palmic acid will continue to induce cell death. But what is also interesting in this case is that we start to uh, see also production of pro-inflammatory cytokine, especially 10-alpha-alpha, alpha, which is no, uh, known to be in, involved in the uh, regenerative process in the liver and be a key cytokines uh, for liver inflammation. So that shows you that you know, with this model, we can uh, directly look at cell death, lipid accumulation, but also pro-inflammatory response. And we are also you know, now characterizing the fibrosis because we know that those cells, especially stellar cells, we start to secrete extracellular matrix, meaning that we can also model this part of the disease. So what I just show you now is that we have a directly a, a very good uh, model system that will allow us to uh, to directly look at very complex disorder in vitro and at the different step-by-step -step that lead to liver failure in the context of non-alcoholic fat liver, liver disease. And you know, we are, of course, now using the system to better understand the mechanism that are involved in uh, uh, this progression, but also you know what are the key genetic modifiers that are increased susceptibility to this disease. And uh, that's an important point, is that... Uh, uh, NAFLD progression is known to have a strong genetic component. Uh, Biically, you know, there's been a lot of GWAS studies on, on NAFLD NASH, progressive disease, and one of the key genes in this, uh, and one of the key GWAS eats is PNPA3, which biically a gene that is associated with 20 or 30 percent of the population which was uh, progressive NASH NAFLD. So it's a very, very strong genetic variant. And what is in, uh, interesting is that, so this variant is known to, to be associated in human with the disease, but when you induce the same variant in the mouse, okay, you don't induce uh, fatty liver in those mouse. What is also in, interesting is that in the mouse, these genes is not highly expressed in the liver, it's a very highly expressed in adipocyte, which suggests that this function in the, uh, in the function of these genes may have diverge during evolution and maybe different between uh, human and mouse. So again, no, very interesting gene, key in the disease probably, but we don't really know its function in the progression of the human disease. And so that's why we decided to look into it. And for that, what we decided to, um, to do, so just a bit of intuition of PNP3. So we, we know it's involved with lipid processing. It's involved especially with lipid droplet formation and that it's involved with a triglyceride. It's a tri triglyceride lip lipase, so it's, it's involved in the tri triglyceride pollution cascade. But apart from that, we don't understand how the genetic variant is influencing the disease progression. So what we decided to do directly is to uh, study the gene in our human prepotent stem cells model. And uh, we uh, did two things. We first generated the full knockout of the gene because that's the best way to really understand what's going on with the gene. So we uh, deleted the entire gene. And then we induced, uh, we also recreated the point mutation that is uh, involved in the genetic variant, so which is called I148I, which by clear we'll call that the knock-in versus the knockout. Okay, And then we characterize the cells and show that indeed, no, the knockout uh, delayed the expression of the gene, uh, while the knocking you know, and use only an, a, a small uh, decrease in the expression. So what is important is that those lines that we generated, so we you know, generate a lot of different lines, but those lines you know, keep the same capacity of differentiation, which can generate a parasite, and basically the mutation have no effect on the process of differentiation itself. Uh, then we started to grow those cells in 3D and add the fatty acid um, to see what was happening. So that's the control, and what you can see is that what we, uh, you know, we were expecting is when we had olic acid on the control, we have accumulation of lipids. Okay. But what was interesting is that the knock-in and knock-out, we started to see accumulation of lipids before the control, even in untreated cells. And this accumulation even increased further when we add the olic acid. So really, you know, though, it seems that the PNLP3 mutation has strongly increased the capacity to the capacity of hepatocyte to uptake lipids. We treated with palmic acid, and what we observe in this case is that cell death in the control is lipotoxic, but in the knock-in and the knockout, the cells were perfectly fine, and instead of dying, they were starting to uptake lipids, lipids so they became you know, full of those droplet, lipid droplets. And that's the same thing here, now shown in terms of viability. You can see that now in the control, palmic acid will kill most of your cells, whereas in knock-in and the knockout, you have a very strong decrease of this, uh, no, this lethality, basically. Whereas, you know, you have a very strong 
in the fat accumulation. So that means that, strangely enough, okay, PNLP3 protects against, PNLP3 mutation protects against uh, lipotoxicity, which is, of course, counterintuitive since you know, this variant is strongly involved in the disease progression. So we started to do a lot of different uh, analysis, including lipodemics to understand what is going on. And what we observe is clearly, you know, when you uh, have mutation in PNMP3, you completely change the lipidemic profile of your hepatocytes. They start to produce much more triglyceride than they used to. And uh, so that's not uh, just to make a long story short. Basically, what we uncover is that, uh, in fact, you no know, mutation in PNMP3 uh, we channel the uh, metabolism of fatty acid into glycerol, into triglyceride. So basically, when we have mutation in PNP3, your fatty acid are much more efficiently transformed into triglyceride. And to demonstrate that is, it was true, what we use, what we do it is to basically block triglyceride synthesis in hepatocytes carrying the mutation in PNP3. And what we observe is that when we do that, we reestablish some of the uh, no, lipotoxicity that we observe in the control. So certainly not the only pathway, but clearly, you know, this, this re-channeling of uh, fatty acid into triglyceride is a way that uh, the pin and pitch mutant line are escaping lipotoxicity. But as I told you, know, it's, it's fairly strange because that doesn't fit with the, the phenotype of, of the patient. You no, know, those patients that does mutation always end up in trouble. Their liver collapse and they end up in, in liver failure and such liver disease. Uh, very progressively, but that's happened. So all in vitro data suggest the opposite, suggest that those people should be able to take a lot of fatty acid and be protected against that. So what we decided to do then is to check if those uh, patients, I mean, those cells could be more sensitive, in fact, to other type of injury, okay? Because all liver you know, is really taking all the heat of our normal life, basically. And so what we decided to check is that if, for example, the hepatocyte that carrying PNLP2 mutation could be more sensitive to ethanol insult, to internal uh, uh, toxicity. And so we put ethanol in our cells uh, and then uh, look at what was the effect on the different uh, genotype. And what we can see is that systematically, um, hepatocyte generated you know, with the PNLP2 mutation were much more sensitive to ethanol uh, uh, toxicity. Meaning that hepatocyte that carry PNLP3 are basically much more sensitive to other type of liver injury. And we tested you know, other type of, of, um, of insulin killing uh, uh, no, um, uh, drugs, paracetamol, and so on. And we can see that consistently those cells are more fragile than the uh, wild type hepatocyte. So, which means that basically, uh, you know, when you have a hepatocyte, um, you put fatty acid, it will accumulate fatty acid. Uh, you put too much fatty acid, it will induce cell death of those hepatocytes. When you have mutation in PNP3, that's going to decrease the cell death for sure. But at the same time, it's going to very strongly increase the sensitivity of those hepatocytes to other type injury. And that's going to generate cell death. And basically, what we suspect now is that those patients with PNP3 mutation will in fact be, uh, no, have liver disease, not because of their fatty acid, but because they are receiving no other injury, they drink, they take drugs, and that's what is the damaging their liver ultimately. And no, that's of course uh, really important in the management of those patient population, but also in the development of new drug because a lot of companies right now are developing drug, uh, no, to modulate PNP3 activity. And clearly, you know, there is a message beyond that that we should be very careful on which way we're going to increase or decrease the activity of these genes. Okay, so that's, no, I think give you again a view of how we can really, I think, understand better biology of disease and also probably know what we hope to have an impact on uh, you know, patient management and, and clinical application. Now I'm going to go back, you know, and I will spend the last uh, part of my talk really on, on more biological question, which you know, is also the drive of, of my lab, is to understand better, better how the liver is, is formed. So, what I, I told you, you know, a key challenge for us is to basically try to generate hepatocyte in 35 days when it takes almost two years in vivo. And that's a consequence. The, the main consequence of that is that the cells we generate in vitro are not fully adult cells. They, in fact, have a key mark of fetal cells. 
So they're basically an intermediate between you know, uh, early hepatocyte and late hepatocyte. They're not fully, fully uh, functionally mature. And of course, no could be a drawback for a number of applications. And um, a lot of lab, including ours, now have spent a lot of time trying to find solutions to improve the functionality of those cells. How can we basically increase this functional maturity of the cells, speed up their development in vitro? So now we tried, like a, a lot of other lab, you now to small molecule screen, gross factors. I've shown you co culture and it's improved, but it doesn't really make you know, the cells fully functional. Uh, we use different uh, 3D culture and with different SCM, and that never really changed things. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is that we try everything we could and we haven't found a solution. And we're not the only one have to have tried. And that's why what we decided to do is to basically go back to study human liver development. Because our key problem is that we don't understand well enough how the liver is developed and what is the mechanism that leads to functional maturation of hepatocyte during human development. And to do that, uh, we decided to basically map the development of the human liver using single cell transcriptomic. Um, so, now we collected different fetal liver and we uh, did 10x genomics on those uh, liver to basically map at a single cell level, at the cellular level, uh, how would basically the different cell type that compose the adult liver develop, uh, really with the idea to understand what are the key mechanisms of functional maturation. And now we, uh, that's give you an overview of what we generated. So no, that's the collection of cells we have so far. Uh, we go from five weeks post, uh, conception to 17 weeks. We have also adult liver and, uh, using this approach, we can is isolate you now the five main cell type of the liver, cholangiocytes, hepatocytes, kepha cells, tel cells, and tel cells. So it's not a perfect, uh, map because you now we have cell type that underrepresented it, like the cholangiocyte. But we start to have a good representation of you no know, a key cell type like hepatocyte. And then you now what we did is the user analysis is basically try to really understand what is the developmental trajectory of each of the cell type during development. And of course, our main focus was hepatocyte since the key functional unit of the liver. That here does give you a PC analysis of only the hepatocyte clusters. And you can see that really we have a nice process of development and differentiation where we basically can distinguish different stage of uh, development of those hepatocytes. And using this approach and also in my progression, what we found is that no, we have likely four, five stages of development. Two stages that are really early that represent a kind of stem cell progenitor for the liver, what we call hepatoblast one and hepatoblast two. And I will come back on that. And then two stages we call fetal hepatocyte one and fetal hepatocyte two that are intermediate stage of hepatocyte development. And of course, then we have adult. And what was very interesting with the liver is that we really, each of those stages of development, basically, correspond to uh, um, a gain of, of function. Okay. Well, we can see that clearly during uh, human development, hepatocytes act here very progressively uh, metabolic activity and metabolic function. So they start now by uh, being a stem cell-like population, gain some uh, Ion kind of uh, metabolism, then gain detoxification process, uh, especially on xenobiotic uh, metabolism, blood coagulation factors. Then they start to process lipids, and then at the end, or oh, really get, get steroid, steroid metabolism and biocid processing. So you really have a hierarchy of function and a very step by step process in in, in human liver development. And again, now in the mouse, the problem is that all that is probably also occurring, but it's happening in less than two weeks. Uh, so, uh, what is also important that at this progressive metabolic acquisition and also functional maturation is very specific to uh, hepatocyte. If you look at other cells like stellar cells, they will probably form this blob on the PCA, suggesting that by, you know, clearly you have one early stage, uh, a very early stellar cell stage, which probably are common progenitors within the stellar cells that differentiate into stellar cells fetal cell cells that will mature a bit when they come to adult. So clearly, no, uh, this functional, the functional maturation we observe with hepatocyte is specific to hepatocyte. Uh, and that probably also explains why it's so, uh, no, it's so difficult to basically, um, induce this maturation in vitro because you have so many steps, so, so many steps to reproduce in the dish. Uh, 
What we also did know is that directly using this map is to try to uh, know, uh, define what was the cell-cell interaction between the different cell type in the liver during development to directly identify signaling pathway that could control this uh, maturation process. That's uh, no, a software called CellPhoneDB that have been developed by our collaborators at Tuxman Lab. And directly using that, we can uh, no, identify that, for example, uh, hepatocyte no, will have a strong interaction for active insulin with uh, um, undertail cells and, 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 and stellar cells. So using that now, we likely been to show that stellar cells have a key role in early development to uh, induce you know, bioclip proliferation and self-renewal of hepatoblasts through wind CNE. And that's important because you now stellar cells are very famous for their uh, bad reputation disease, but their function in early development is, is less understood. Um, so that's now show you how we can use single cells bioclip to understand a bit better the same pathway that control uh, liver organogenesis. What is also interesting is that we're using these single cells. In fact, we have been able to identify uh, a no, population of cells that are potential stem cells of the liver, developmental stem cells uh, that you know, are known but have never been isolated or grown in vitro, uh, like the hepatoblast. And using this approach, what we decided to do directly is to take those two populations, hepatoblast 1 and hepatoblast 2, and then grow them in vitro in 3D culture conditions to directly grow them as organoids. So those three culture culture conditions that were initially developed for uh, the gut, we basically uh, use them to grow uh, organoid from the fetal liver. And so now we uh, screen different culture conditions and basically from culture conditions that allow us to grow those beautiful organoids that call, uh, are called hepatoblast organoid and that express no high level of albumin and that uh, basically are uh, at the same level on primary hepatocytes, express low level of biliary cells, what we'd expect for um, hepatoblast, and they will express no fetal marker like alpha fetoprotein. They express homogeneous those marker. It can be expanded now for at least 10, 15 passages in vitro. Uh, those, so those cells are very similar to their uh, primary uh, counterparts. So in green, you have the hepatoblast organoid. In red, you have the primary hepatoblast. And bikely is a superpose. They are almost identical in terms of transcriptomic uh, profile. And so bikely for the first time, you now we can grow uh, you no know, structure that represent the fetal liver in a dish in vitro. And they are you no know, a very, very good representation of what's happening during normal development. So then uh, what we decided to do is to basically test that those cells have the development of potential uh, you know, of uh, liver stem cells. And basically, you know, uh, they, if they are truly stem cells, they should be able to generate all the cell type of the liver, which are basically the palocyte and the cholangiocyte. To do that, we developed a collaboration with Kelly Steven in uh, Seattle. And Kelly have developed this uh, very beautiful patch, which is basically collagen patch that she can transplant in mouse model for uh, liver failure. And no, she, if she put hepatocyte, those hepatocytes will rescue those mice and will allow them to survive. So we took our hepatoblast organoid, transduced uh, uh, lantivirus expressing RFP, uh, sent those uh, hepatoblasts to Kelly, which put them in those collagen patch, which were then transplanted in those FRG mice. And that's now showing you the patch, showing you that the cells can survive and can form this beautiful nodule that in fact look like primary hepatocyte nodule in this system. And what was really important is that uh, you know, when we took those uh, patch and, and analyzed them at the day zero, they will express alpha photoprotein, so fetal marker. But when you look at the 27, uh, basically this alpha photoprotein is gone, while the expression of uh, hepatocyte marker like keratin, 19, uh, keratin 18 is maintained. Uh, and you know, we can detect albumin in the blue stream, suggesting that indeed those cells are truly basically uh, maturing into hepatocyte in vivo. What was also interesting that those patch uh, also contain uh, keratin 19 positive cells that form those nice structures which resemble bile duct, and suggesting that indeed you no know, the hepatoblasts that have been transplanted can not only differentiate into hepatocyte, but also can differentiate into cholangiocytes. So they have this developmental potential of a liver stem cell that we are, we are looking for. And now uh, that's uh, really interesting because now that allows us to have a, a very good system to look at this functional maturation that we are discussing and to really model this functional maturation. Okay, so now to come back at the original question, I told you about the hepatocyte you now generated in vitro and our objective to improve the maturation of hepatocyte generated from iPS cells. So now. What we decided to do is basically to compare you know, what was missing in hepatocytes generated from IPS with, with hepatocytes that are 
differentiating during normal development. So we did single cell transcriptomic also on hepatocyte generated from IPS. That's no beautiful differentiation here with the progressive acquisition of uh, hepatocyte marker. Then we did a differential gene expression to basically compare our hepatocyte genomes in vitro with hepatocyte with hepatocyte genomes in vivo. And what you can see here is that no, uh, in this diagonal, we just indicate that the profile are extremely similar. So at the very beginning, we don't have, of course, cells from the human development, but then no, the cells are very similar at the first hepatoblast stage. The, of differentiation in vitro and in vivo, they continue like that, but then they completely fell apart after the fetal hepatocyte stage, directly meaning that no, the cells we generate in vitro decide to acquire their uh, own developmental trajectory after uh, the fetal hepatocyte stage equivalent in vivo. So that's really this stage that we need to focus on to directly improve the maturation, the functional maturation of our cells. And to do that, uh, by, you know, we identify factors that seem to be involved in this process. And we are directly screening those factors now by overexpression directly in hepatocyte-like cells to try to induce and, and really uh, augment the expression of those facts, the, the, the maturation of those cells. And just to show you an example here, uh, so that's you know, a factor that we have expressed in our hepatocyte-like cells. And you can see that you now when we have expressed these factors, we increase albumin expression and we lose fetal marker alpha fetoprotein, suggesting that we have a true increase in, in maturation. And so that this factor, you know, which is missing during in vitro differentiation, if we reintroduce him, could help to increase and improve the maturation of the cells with genetic in vitro. Okay. So just to conclude my talk now, you know, and to give you an overview. Um, so human problem stem cell derived hepatocyte you know, can be used to model a, a broad number of disorders. Um, and you no, know, we can already generate new biology. And that's a key, que a key uh, question. And this um, new type of model will, of course, complement existing models like mouse and other system. And we bring a human side that currently is not available. That's no, uh, really important. It's really a combination of models that's going to allow us to better understand disease and develop new drugs. But of course, one of, one of the challenges with the first is that they still lack the functional uh, maturity of a primary hepatocyte, you know, one of the cells that is, is in the liver. And so we are exploring different methods for that. We've shown that 3D and co-culture can improve, but the, the effect is limited. It's not the miracle solution. So that's why we are going back to developmental question. And that's really important because we can only solve this limitation with basic knowledge. And we need to improve our basic knowledge of liver development, especially in, in human. And we think that now the single cell mapping, the uh, fetal organoid, the pedoblast organoid that we have developed, will provide a fantastic method and approach for us to really address those questions and uh, to better understand human development. Uh, so now, and we're already progressing toward that because we have been able to identify key factors that are missing in IPS that could help directly to improve their functional maturation. And now it's really uh, no, a key for us to screen more factors, to understand better the function of these factors to uh, no, and implement that in our in vitro system. And that's really no, by using basic knowledge of human development, in vitro model that are relevant for, the, uh, again, the human liver organogenesis and our in vitro system with human and purple and stem cells that will be able to really address all those questions on functional maturation, but also ultimately to generate cell type with a clinical interest for cell based therapy and for this model. Okay, so what I would like to do is to try to think all the people that have been uh, involved in this work, and that's no, it, it's a lot of people. So um, the work on uh, the work on, on NAFLD Nash modeling in truly with the culture is uh, major to the force on Carol Amoral, a postdoc in the lab. Uh, the work on uh, PNAP3 is done by uh, Samantha Tilson, which is now, uh, now uh, which is, has just finished his uh, PhD at the NIH in, uh, in the US. Um, the work on um, hepatoblast organoid have been done by uh, uh, Bonan Wesley, but also Alexander Ross. So Bonan have done the single cell, Alexander have done the, the hepatoblast work, but also Katerina. Uh, Zacharis, which no, you, you, is now strongly involved in this program and, and leading this program in the lab. Uh, and then also, of course, all the rest of the group, and I'm probably forgetting people here, that have done an amazing uh, work you know, over the past uh, 10 years to drive those projects to completion. So I would like also to thank our founders, especially the ERC, which has been the main source of funding for my lab for the past 10 years. So thank you for your attention. I will be delighted to take more questions. 
Thank you, Professor Valle. That was very interesting. And uh, I, I'm always saying this, but it, it, it is true. You see, uh, having people like you actually discussing the background uh, of uh, clinical research on preclinical stages helps us all understand the challenges behind drug development. And it is always, uh, uh, it, it is always an enlightenment to actually have people like you discussing the challenges involved. And um, if you allow me, I would like to start our discussion with a question based on these, uh, on these challenges. Um, so uh, you have discussed a lot uh, challenges with respect to maturation. Uh, would that also involve, uh, if we go to the next level, challenges to vascularization? And I would like to see, I see often uh, literature popping up uh, with respect to bioartificial liver and pancreas as well. So uh, do you think that this is something that we should be expecting to see uh, on clean, in clinical practice in the next years based on your research? So but there is no, a lot of progress being done. Um, and, and so vascularization is key, of course, no, on the tail cells, uh, have a key role during development, uh, key, of course, functional role in, in the adult liver. And no, that's something that is, is important that we try to incorporate in our model system, but that's one of the cell types that is very difficult to co-culture co with, with the rest. Uh, so that's some, some, some uh, a challenge we have to solve. Um, in, in, uh, and, and so the, the other question was you no, know, the, the clinical application. And, and clearly, you know, there is uh, now several groups that are, you know, all group and other group that are working very actively to transfer that directly in, into the clinic, into cell-based therapy. Um, so if we look at hepatocyte, it's probably one of the most challenging cell type uh, because practically you need a lot of hepatocytes to uh, have a therapeutic effect. And that means that, no, it's it's part of the challenge to be able to now uh, have an industrial process that allows us to produce enough hepatocyte for, for cell-based therapy. But we are actively working on that. And we our goal is in the next three to five years, we'll be able to you know, uh, transplant the first few patients with hepatocyte generated from, from human prepared stem cells. The other site, uh, the Collinger site, no, and I think for this we present data, is already more advanced than that because they have beautiful data and preclinical model, uh, and, and including large animals, showing that they can reuse no, their Collinger site uh, against Collinger patties. And that, uh, I, I think, looks extremely promising and, and no, could move very quick, quickly to the clinic. So no, they, it's advancing. Uh, the liver is a challenging organ, but we, we're getting closer to, uh, to really have a direct uh, you know, intervention in the clinic. That's interesting. Uh, I see a lot of um, a lot of discussions around uh, extracorporeal liver assist devices. Do you think that we could have some sort of let's, let's call it cooperation of uh, stem cell technologies with these sort of devices? Yeah, so that's interesting. So no, uh, by device, I, I, I know I've been around for a long time. Okay. And there is mm -hmm. two kind of challenges with bile device. The first one is that you need a lot of cells. You know, this, those extra corporeal device, uh, you need billions of cells to be able for them to, mm -hmm. to function correctly. And that's always been a challenge because you can't go a side. So people have tried you know, other cell lines like APG2, more recently APRG. Um, and no, still remain a challenge because you still need a lot of cells. But it's, it's getting there. The, the, the other problem is the action system. Okay, because those bio devices are plugged on the circulation and they function as a filter. And the problem is that you don't control, you not, you don't control what you filter. And a lot of time, those patients that are on bio device end up with big problems. You know, they lose even more albumin and they start to have a, a lot of infection issues. And that, I think, is, is kind of a more problematic conceptually because basically, you know, you need to have a blood flow and you need to have a system that uh, allows the cells to to form, to, to basically, you know, be in contact with this flow. And that's complicated, I think. And that's why, you know, bad device have been, you know, are, are actively research, uh, no, developed, but still remain challenging to ap apply in, in real life. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vaya. So, uh, dear attendees, we are now moving forward to your questions. Uh, Dr. Kokotid, if you would like uh, uh, to ask your own questions or if we have feedback from our streaming in Facebook and YouTube, please take the stand. Yes, yeah, so thank you very much, Professor Vaya. Uh, it, uh, it was very interesting, the idea of the hepatoblast organoids. 
And uh, since I come from a biomaterials background, I would like to, to ask a question. If I understood correctly, these cells, cells are being seeded into three d cultures and they, they exhibit similar functionalities with the hepatocytes. So, uh, but, and, but I, I noticed that we are using a collagen scaffold, a 3D collagen scaffold. Is there a specific reason for using this material? I mean, why was it chosen and what is uh, its properties? Okay, so, so when, when, when we look at uh, the, the 3D system for, uh, for Nafal Dinash, no, we use a, a commercial system which is called the Raft. And uh, we use this system because so for, first collagen is in one of the most abundant protein, uh, extracellular matrix protein in the liver. So it's a natural you know, uh, s matrix for, for a parasite. And uh, so that's, that makes sense. It's also very um, versatile. You know, it's very easy to use. You have different formats, so it's, it's very good to use. It's commercially available, so we don't rely you know, on, a, on third party to, 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 to load the system. That's well, our main motivation. But also, of course, you know, we, we are also working uh, you know, with Kelly and other people um, to develop uh, you know, better hydrogel that will allow the cells to, to become a bit more functional with different stiffness, different... And that's you know, something that we currently exploring that is really important. It's clearly... A, Again, a weakness or an oversimplification of our system. But again, our idea was you know, to, to, to buy, you know, focus on what we are good at, which is producing the cells and use a very simple uh, 3D system. But again, I, I agree you know, that uh, looking at more complex um, 3D uh, scaffold, different composition would be very useful. And I guess you are uh, using a 3D printer or it's just a... Uh, oh, it's very... Well, what we so we buy a solution of and so the, it's a kit. You no, know, it's come with a solution of collagen uh, that we put in in well. Uh, I, we may not mix the cells, but those those collagen mix with the cells, you know, and and medium in in the well, and then after we come with a buffer and we aspirate medium, and we end up with a semi solid disc. So it's very simple to uh, to generate and like that. No, and after we just have to put medium on top, and and we have you no know, cells embedded in collagen. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, I would like to, there, there's a question from a student and um, it concerns that, uh, uh, that when is the specific time that this uh, differentiation of the pluripotent cells is happening, uh, should the cells be in the same stage uh, of their cell cycle? Oh. <laughs> I mean, uh, are they synchronized or... Uh, no, so we don't synchronize. So, um, okay, so that's no, that's a long, uh, to, to give you a long story short. So when we uh, do, do the differentiation, the cells are not synchronized for cell cycle. But we know that they uh, don't receive the signal um, the same way in different phases of the cell cycle. So basically, you induce differentiation in G1. And more precisely, you induce differentiation in early, early G1. So when you have a culture of human propellant stem cells and you induce differentiation, you will have, Five to ten percent of the cells are going to differentiate immediately because they are in early G1. The rest are going to need to progress to cell cycle to come back to early G1, and that will, of course, happen at different speed depending on their position in cell cycle, which explains why we always get a, a, a certain level of heterogeneity in our in our culture system. But what, what is is interesting is that no, we. We know that now because we've done a lot of work on this aspect, but empirically, you no, know, all protocols have been developed to allow the cells to at least cycle once before we change of uh, culture conditions to reach another step of differentiation. Um, so there's always a heterogeneity, but we have adapted our protocol to, to try to bypass that. But cell cycle is really important. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I'll give the word to uh, uh, Dr. Valla. So she can continue with the questions. We have one more question from our audience. Uh, Professor Vaye, do you think that in the long term, hepatoplast organoids or HPSC derived hepatocyte will be more useful uh, in clinical settings? So, uh, no. So I think the hepatoblast um, are amazing system because they are truly a, a massive development of potential. They you know, can bikely form... Uh, hepatocyte and cholangiocyte, and they are truly functional stem cells. It's the only stem cell of the liver we can grow currently. Uh, no, that's, that's really important. So that's fantastic. There's two challenges on that. First, no, it's difficult to grow them in large quantity because we have this 3D uh, system in a uh, uh, matrogel, which is challenging. And also, of course, there's the fetal origin. 
And no, whatever we do, we will not be able to really develop, I think, a clinical treatment based uniquely on filtered tissue. That's the reality of things now for ethical reason, but also for practical reason, because it's almost impossible to generate enough hepatoblasts for no, to, to develop a, a, a treatment for a, a poor population. But what we're, of course, uh, trying to do now is to generate bona fide hepatoblasts from human proton stem cells, which will solve all the issues I just mentioned. And I think the future of hepatoblasts is not primary hepatoblasts generated from fetal tissue, but hepatoblasts generated from human proton stem cells. Thank you. So we have the Hayes with us. Good afternoon again. Hello again. Professor Valier, what a pleasure and honor to have you with us. Thank, Thank you. you so much. It was uh, excellent. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank you also because you deployed your whole strategy, which is something quite interesting for the young uh, uh, scientists. Eh? Is that so? And uh, I also realized that uh, first I have to start uh, doing some diet to avoid this body. <laughs> These things, it's uh, amazing. And uh, I realized also that... Uh, you have uh, the ancient Greek of Prometheus inspired you for the uh, liver generation and all these things. It's nice to hear that. I have a question, uh, if you please. Uh, we developed this kind, let's say, of uh, of our of uh, different approaches in order to come with a cure at the end. Uh, so you think that the organoids uh, can be used at the moment as uh, as a basis? Uh, for example, for uh, for having uh, extra, uh, let's say, uh, research, research uh, uh, disease on disease, or can be part of the new cure. So, the, the no, the, the organoid I think is is um, is a fantastic model. Um, so it's can it's definitely a very good model to study uh, development in the case of hepatoblasts. But in case of cholangiocyte organoid that uh, Fotis will. Uh, present that can be derived from adult tissue are very interesting for uh, you know, regenerative medicine application, uh, cell-based therapy, uh, and also for, for this modeling. I think the, the, the advantage of IPS is that we can really access you know, a lot of different diversity of patients. And organoid, you know, you still require invasive procedure to get biopsies, to get access to primary tissue. Also, you know, when you are patient that already very advanced in the disease, the cells are, are already affected by the disease. So you can't really study what is inducing the disease with organoid. You can only add a picture, which is an advantage, but also drawback on the end stage of, of the of the disease. So no, I think organoid and IPS have complementary qualities. And 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 likely now what is great is that we can use both systems to ask the best possible question. Uh, and no, we don't use them in opposition in the lab, we use them to do complementary, uh, no, to, to address complementary question. How long you think, you think that we are from finding uh, a cure uh, in this kind of... Uh, that, that depends, well, that depends for what type of cure, no, I mean, so it depends on the disease. Okay, so for example, for nafeldina... To avoid transplantation, for example. For cell based therapy, so no, I, I say, no, we, we starting very actively now to work on, uh, you no, know, developing, uh, therapy for acute liver failure, uh, for, you no, know, uh, with encapsidation and so on. And that's something that, you no, know, with the right funding, with the right support, we can bikely accelerate and, and next few years, you no, know, it's not, uh, next 20 years, it's next few years, we can bikely, uh, transplant the first few patients because we have the technology, uh, you no, know, we can, exp we can produce large quantity of cells. Uh, we have identified the right uh, cohort of patients, so we 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 are there. There is a lot of practical aspect to be solved, a lot of preclinical study to perform, but we I think we have solved the technical challenge, the initial technical challenge. Now it's more you know uh, GMP production, industrialization, um, clinical uh, aspect, and that that you know, takes a lot of time, and it's always a part of uncertainty around it. But we, we are getting closer and closer. Again, no question of resource, so we can find the right support to have the funding necessary for this kind of, of, of clinical study, which are extremely expensive, of course. Always a the funding is uh, <laughs> the basic parameter in all these things. Wonderful. All right. Uh, Dr. Valla, you have the floor. Uh, thanks okay. again. Uh, Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, I think so if we have any questions from uh, Facebook or YouTube streaming. Uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Mrs. Androniki Kretsovali, a researcher uh, here in the Fourth Institute. Thank you for the fantastic presentation, and uh, we all do. So, Chrisa, unless we have any other questions, and please, our attendees, if you would like to raise your hand or there is a, a, a question pattern, you can just type your question in here and we will forward it to Professor Valier. Okay, then. Okay, yes. So, uh, again, Manos Athanasiadis, Associate Professor uh, from Biomedical Research Foundation Academy of Athens, is thanking you for the enlightening presentation. I see we have no more questions, so we wouldn't want to abuse your time that you have so generously <laughs> offered us. Uh, we would like to thank you uh, personally and on behalf of Greek Scientist Society. It has been a very interesting discussion. Uh, hopefully we will have the chance uh, to meet again soon uh, in another one. We would also like to thank uh, uh, our attendees in all platforms, Ermit, Facebook, uh, YouTube. Uh, next week we have uh, uh, a new webinar. You will be informed on our social media. Thank you everyone so much. Thank have you. a nice afternoon.